So here we are at the APT Gallery in Deptford. And Good evening. Hi, and this is Joyce Le Chien and Audrey Mullins, who is one of the exhibiting artists, and I'm Fionn Gunn. And we're here to discuss this evening uh, issues around the experience of artists with institutions. So um, I'd like to pass over to you immediately, Joris. What a surprise. <laughs> yeah, what a surprise. <laughs> and, and, and just hear what your um, experience of talking to artists and their experiences is like. And, uh, and yeah, well, let's start with that. Right, well, yeah, maybe I should, um, I was about to say, I'm, I'm not an artist myself, so give the context, but you gave the context sort of by saying my experience from talking to artists, but at the same time, am I not an artist? That's another debate. But anyway, um, so I, I would approach this, the, the conversation from the angle of someone who uh, whose work focuses on the relationship between the individual and the systems. And in this instance, we're talking about institutions as systems in and of themselves, but also representat representative of sy systems, because usually in order to be an institution, you have to have benefited or to be embedded into existing systems um, when it comes to money, when it comes to administration, um, etc. So, and obviously, as you can imagine, this is a, um, not a two-way street because this is a very um, un, un what's the term that I'm looking for? It's unbalanced, unbalanced and it's unequal. Yes, unequal, unbalanced, yeah. asymmetrical. That's an asymmetrical relationship between an individual and a system. So that's already the first thing. And so, of course, there's already that frustration from artists or for, from anyone who has to deal with with institutions and administrations. Um, but on top of that, what happens is that artists are usually people who, well, if you're an artist, it's probably because you have a certain sensitivity, um, a certain fragility as well. And um, that, putting that out there and, and having to deal with institutions who then have immense power over you whilst you are working with your emotions, your fragility, your identity as well, your experience of marginalization, because this is usually what art is about, um, that creates an even more unbalanced situation. And, and very often institution, institutions sort of mm, exploit that situation. There, there's a very exploitative um, relationship between artists and, and institutions. Um, the fact that institutions very often are designed to be faceless. Um, and so, and artists tend to be extremely sensitive to this kind of, uh, of things, very sensitive to um, human relations. So um, those would be the things that I would say compound the difficult relationship between institutions and artists um, that make them even more yeah, difficult than for someone who's not an artist. Um, but I would also add into that because actually, I kind of challenge your notion about mm -hmm. artists being fragile. Okay. I think, in a sense, we're not really more fragile than the next person. Maybe in some ways, maybe some people. Um, but you know, I think we're all. I think one of the main difficulties that artists have dealing with institutions is that our role as artists is often to be that of a disruptor, mm -hmm. and institutions don't like disruptors. And they don't like difficult questions. Um, and, you know, from my own experience, that has certainly been the case. Um, but tell me a bit about some of the artists that you've worked with who've had really terrible experiences with institutions. And then afterwards, I'd love to share, you, share with you mm -hmm. and all of the audience what happened with me because yes. that was also terrible. Mm. Okay, so, well, first I would like to, to bounce back on your on, on, on the comment about fragility. And, and I completely, I think I agree with you, um, but maybe I, I, I could broaden up the, the concept of fragility because when I say artists are fragile, I, I could specify that they are aware of their fragility and they have the strength to put it forward to work with it because everybody is fragile, uh, but most people 
try to hide it under the rug uh, at the back of their heads, whereas the artists not only are they aware of their fragility, but also they decide to yeah bring it forward. So by saying that, by doing that, the artist is ex extremely strong. So it is a strength in that context. Fragility is a strength, but that also means that it can be exploited um, because putting yourself in a position of vulnerability. So maybe that's that's a better word. Uh, that's that's more what I wanted to what I, I tried to describe is uh, the willingness of artists to use their fragility and their vulnerability to use it. Um, so yeah, and very often systems um, make them, they take advantage of that. And um, so yeah, so as for examples, um, well, so I, I work on trying to draw parallels between multiple experiences of marginalization because I believe that they all stem from power dynamics between the dominant group and its systems and the marginalized experience, communities, identities. So in that context, I have met artists who have experienced all forms of oppression enacted by, the ad by administrations and institutions. So, um, I, yeah, I've, it's a little bit against my, 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 my practice to tell other people's stories, but I, I'm gonna try to give broad examples. Um, but yes, there are institutions, for instance, there is such a thing as institutional um, homophobia. Many artists who are queer, um, and, and when I talk about that, it's, it's very important to say that um, uh, that happens, that can happen without intentions. But there is such a thing as institutional homophobia or queer phobia, such a thing as institutional racism, um, such a thing as institutional misogyny, but I will not expand on that because mm. I know you will. <laughs> yes. um, and institutional classism as well. Mm. So all of those things are simply um, power imbalances that already exist in society, but when you're in a position of power such as an institution, then yes, you are bound to exploit those, those inequalities. And very often an institution is an institution because it represents a power, also already an established um, source of oppression. Um, when, you know, when you see museums like uh, the British Museum, that's the most obvious one, but that is um, the that benefits from a long history of colonization, and not just the history, the material history, but also the mindsets, the mindsets that need to exist in order for colonization to be achieved, and that still persists to this day, even though colonization in, in, in the institutions might not still be a thing, but in the mindsets and in the structures that still exist, that is definitely perpetrated. There is a power imbalance here, that still is maintained and upheld by the institutions. So for, for instance, an artist, uh, a racialized artist from coming from the colonized world, um, the relationship with those institutions and the way that they perceive themselves, the way that they see themselves represented and respected um, is going to be completely different, a different experience from um, a, a white, um, British person, for instance. Um, so, yeah, those things enter into consideration, yes. Have you had any... Sorry, can we let... So, if you'd like to ask the question again, just put the mic against your chin and just Sorry. ask. Can I ask, Fian, what have you had any experience with dealing with institutions? Yes, I have, unfortunately. And um, that was a cautionary tale. And, um, and not only have I had experience of dealing with institutions, but I've been threatened with legal action when I made a, I didn't even make a complaint. I actually um, sent a message to the Minister for Diasporas in Ireland about how difficult it is for Irish diaspora artists to not just be recognized, but to be measured within collections in Britain. And, and I received a threat of, of, um, of uh, judicial action that, that I might be sued, which struck me as really strange because it's not like I, I signed an NDA 
um, and I wouldn't have had anyway. And also, uh, I hadn't actually been making a complaint against the institute itself that had um, collaborated with me. I was making a general point about the experience of Irish diaspora artists, and obviously, I hit a nerve. So the, the threat did not come from the uh, the Minister for, for the Diaspora, right? That no, not from, at all. Okay. In fact, all right. the Minister for the Diaspora, the reason I had contacted him was because he had such an immensely positive response to my exhibition in Liverpool. Um, and I'm used to, to politicians and diplomats going around my exhibitions and going, oh, yes, that's very interesting. Da, da, da. This was a completely different response. The guy just said, oh, my God, this is amazing. He actually stayed twice the length of time that was allotted to him um, in the exhibition and was immensely interested. And it was for that reason that I had contacted him. So how did the institution find out about your complaint? Uh, it wasn't a complaint against them. I actually wrote uh, an email to the minister because where the institution where I had exhibited, the gallery and museum where I had exhibited, had refused to purchase an artwork after a five-month exhibition, which had increased footfall by 28% and had immensely positive feedback. So we're seeing um, the exploitative nature of that relationship already absolutely. because they benefited from it. And you were led to believe that you would also in some way be retributed for that and you weren't. Yes, absolutely Sorry. not. And not only that, but I had been responsible for um, putting together the proposal for which uh, an Arts Council grant was awarded. Um, and the only bits that I didn't write were the bits that were the institutional bits that I couldn't write. Um, and, uh, and there was a huge delay in payments. So the Arts Council awarded the grant in February 2022, and I didn't receive a payment until, I think it was September when I received, um, it might have, I might have received a recompense for expenses paid in July, but I didn't receive any fees until September. And that was money sitting in the account of the university. Um, and, and also, in uh, so it's quite interesting because um, in the email, the threatening email that I got, um, one of the things that was said that was that I had received a total of £17,000 for my year's work. And so I actually went back and, and looked at all the figures. And I started working on this project um, and putting together the proposal and and collating and curating the artworks that would go into the exhibition in October 2020, 2020, 2021. And the residency that I did was from 2022 to 23 March. Okay, so we're talking about a period of about 13 months, give or take. And of the amount that I, um, I was told that I had been awarded, which um, was like 17,000. Um, I went back and I looked and the residency uh, award that I got, well, well, that wasn't an award, that was just a residency payment for producing uh, new artworks and delivering um, workshops, public workshops, and in a sort of studio Eventbrite context. And I received for the... Um, the period of time I received £4,000 for that. For uh, the fees that I received from the Arts Council, um, and that was for um, actually work done, so that was me delivering workshops and being on site and installing and all the rest of it, um, that totaled um, £5,850. And so my earnings over 13 months from a residency and an exhibition that took all of my time, 12 hours a day, six days a week. My earnings were £9,850. So thank you for that. Are you supposed um, to live on this? Uh, uh, you're not, actually. Um, it, it was disgraceful. And I would say that there was, uh, in terms of the promises made, and so I've learned this lesson. and. 
So all of you artists out there, when you're offered contracts and residencies, go through the fine print. So I was offered uh, this residency and I waited and waited and waited to get a contract and no contract came through. In this email from the individual who contacted me, threatening me with legal action, he says uh, very clearly, you were given a contract on the 4th of April, 2022. But you know, my residency was launched publicly with a festival and fanfare on the 31st of March, 2022. And the only reason that I did get a contract was because I sent an email saying, you've launched my residency. I don't know what it is. What are you offering? I had, I had been asked for input about what a residency could entail. I'd offered certain models and means of payment and what I could offer. And, and that was the response. What sort of protection do you think should be put in place for artists working with institutions? Well, I think one of the first protections that should be put in place is that um, universities and other institutions that get grants from Arts Council England should be forced to pay in a timely fashion. And they should be obliged to send very detailed instructions to the artists about how they go through the invoice procedure, because that was not provided in my case at all, nor was it provided to the people that I brought in to the project, other artists and those people who did transport and all the rest of it. I can tell you this much, there was absolutely no support offered, no logistical support offered. I did all the logistical work myself. I designed the catalogue, I arranged for the printing, I arranged for the curatorial essay. There was not a single thing that I was responsible for that I did not do correctly but anything that was left to the institution was haphazard. Things like I sent measurements through for uh, glass cases and one of them, the measurements was confused and it was reversed. And the institution tried to blame me for that. I'm a very organized person. I don't make mistakes with measurements. So all of these things, you know, it, it made for a very stressful time. Um, it made for a very impoverished time. And yet the Footfall was amazing, and the response from the public was amazing, for which I am extremely grateful. And I would also say the staff at the museum and gallery where I had the exhibition were amazing. I mean, they were absolutely wonderful. Um, and I guess the next point to make, and maybe you need to ask me, is what the purchasing committee of uh, the university decided. So just to give context, um that would, part of the expectation was that they would purchase uh, one of your pieces because that is part of what an artist needs in order to survive. It's not just what you got, what you received um, in terms of payments because that obviously would not be enough, but there was a tacit agreement, I suppose. So that was not in the contract, was it? No, there was no contract. Oh, yes. I've learned my lesson. I'm mm -hmm. never doing anything without a written contract again. So a five month exhibition, one would have thought, would have resulted in uh, the purchase of an artwork, especially when the public response has been so positive. So um, when this was put forward to the purchasing committee at the University of Liverpool, I'm naming names, um, the response was uh, they wanted to diversify their collection and therefore um, they had chosen, instead of buying an artwork by me, an Irish diaspora artist, they had decided to buy prints by Yinka Shonabara, but that I was welcome to donate an artwork if I wanted. <sighs> now, having said this, I had already donated um, the uh, artworks, my sculptural artworks, which were um, modeled, 3D modeled, and which were, um, which became part of an app for the museum and gallery. Um, so I feel my work is already part of their collection. I received no payment for that. Um, and so I didn't see why I should donate another artwork. And this is interesting because this is a typical example of, of using diversity as a, a, an excuse 
and a performative um, thing because yes, that's great. That is a great intention to try to diversify um, the artist and who they purchase from, but they still exploited you. So that is something that sh they should have thought about. If that was the real intention and motivation, why did it not think about that before they hired you, before they demanded that much of your time, of your work, of your labor, um, you were still exploited in the situation and they're fully aware of it. So they probably know better in terms of diversity. Um, did, yes, I, I, I was wondering, did any of the, uh, what were, were the other artists that were offered res residency? Were they? Well, were interestingly, they the residency and the exhibition were two different things. Okay. So I have to draw a line mm -hmm. under that. Okay. So the residency was a separate issue. The exhibition was another issue. The exhibition, which took place at the Victoria Gallery and Museum, uh, was largely funded by Arts Council England. So the money didn't go to me because as I've said already, what did I get? I got 5,000 and whatever it was, mm. pounds. And the, the total grant was uh, 20, 23,000 pounds in the region of, and, and most of that went to support the gallery in their installation costs and all the rest of it, fair enough. Um, however, in terms of the purchase of artworks and what you're talking about tokenism, oh my God. Okay, so, I'm Irish diaspora, and the Irish diaspora is the largest minority community in Liverpool. And, um, and so on the day that I heard this, I thought, I'm going to go around the permanent collection, which is on show right now, that was concurrent with my exhibition. Now, obviously, that permanent collection, they, they change it. It's not always the same. But I thought, let me do a head count anyway and see what I turn up with. And what I found that was that out of 36 artists that were shown, four of them were women. One of those women had a piece like this size hanging just by the toilets. Even Dame Elizabeth Frink, who had two artworks on show, she had a sculpture shoved in by the lift, which you can't really see properly. Um, and all the rest of the artists were uh, English artists, possibly Scottish, I don't know, but they were all men. And so that was 32 out of 36 artists were men and they were not, um, they were not black men. They were not men of color. They were English and Scottish men. Mm -hmm. And when I drew attention to that, um, the person who responded to me and threatened me with legal action said, oh, but they've collected Rita Duffy's work. Now, can I just say, Rita Duffy is a very great artist. I admire her work. She is a Northern Irish artist, and she is not diaspora. And so I think, where are your arguments there? I, I, I don't understand the logic of an institution that has no responses to this. I mean, it, it's made even worse because they use that that argument to deny, to deny you um, retribution or, or compensation um, yeah, not retribution <laughs> yes. no yeah. but to, den to, to deny an artist reasonable recompense mm -hmm. for a five-month exhibition which has been incredibly successful yeah um yeah it's what we tend to forget is the exploitative nature of it so yeah the fact that they benefited from it because if it hadn't been successful if you know for whatever reason then it's not that it would be un understandable, but at least they would have a leg to stand on, but that's not the case. Um, so yes, that's, that's, that, that's a perfect example. Um, so uh, I, I would like to ask you though, how did the person who threatened you, how did they know about, did you also send it to them, the, the, the letter that you wrote to them? Yes, the because I was okay. being transparent, because okay. I wasn't actually, I wasn't actually complaining directly about that institution, although I could have done because yeah, they were very in lame in terms of, you know, there was none of the support available that had been promised. There was also a change of, per this is an interesting point as well, there was a change of personnel. So the person who had first contacted me and asked me about this got moved on and then somebody else came in and was going, well, I, I might just drop the project. And so I'm already into the project. 
oh, I might just drop it because, you know, I didn't, I wasn't involved with this. So, it, so there were a lot of threats all the way that's along already, the line. Yeah, someone in a position of power over you yeah. for something. And that's how the institutions work. Yes. Um, because again, you're not dealing with one individual, you're dealing with people who get shifted around. And um, yeah, so there's no accountability there, no responsibility because mm. the person you're dealing with was not the person who put you in that position. Um, yeah, so. And um, not only that, but um, when everything came to a head and, um, and, and then I, w I had another residency, uh, I had two other residency workshops that had been booked in for the year and uh, and I always, if, if I agree to something, I will always do it. I will always carry it through because that is the professional way. So um, I was asked on the fifth one, so I had done four on, in, two, in 2020, 2022, and so there were two events planned for 2023. So at the last minute, uh, one of them was canceled, okay? And so the last event, I was asked by the director to have a meeting with him after the workshop event. So I held a workshop event, which was very successful, and the administrator was there, and suddenly she left, and I was left on my own with him. And he was incredibly threatening and abusive, and he shouted at me, and when I said, excuse me, you know, he said, don't you excuse me, and, and shouting at me, and, and I just said, I'm not going to have this conversation with you, um, he accused me of all kinds of things, and I said, "I'm walking out. I'm not having this conversation with you now." What, and I went. What started? The, what, what sparked this this argument? Oh, because he said, "I want to know what you're doing and why. Why have you sent this email to the minister?" Oh. And so, all of that. And I, I said, "I wasn't sending it to actually complain about you. I was complaining about the system, you know. And 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 yes, you should have supported me more, but you know, I was complaining about the system." And he just went off on one. And he was incredibly abusive and threatening. And I had to say, I'm leaving here. I'm not discussing this with you. And then I went off and I met some friends afterwards and I told them all of this. So, you know, these are people within the community who know what happened. Right. And yeah, and the, yeah, this is, and so yeah, here we have, we, we're dealing with individuals who, um, so, yeah, there's always a, a, a change between systems and individuals. When you criticize systems, individuals put themselves in the way and take it for them, but exactly. without taking accountability for the failures of the system, but they will then threaten you as an individual. So this, this was you, you, you just the person, you yes. cannot hide behind a system. There's, no. There's, so, um, and, and what was, you know, doubly terrible is, you know, I'm somebody, I always take responsibility for my actions. I always fulfill my agreements and deadlines, and I'm very correct about this. And to be accused by somebody in this way, I found profoundly insulting and infuriating. And, and I will take it further because I think one of the things that has to happen is that the Arts Council needs to know that when it gives grants to institutions, that they actually do the correct thing by artists and that they don't just get the money, sit on it for months, delay on payments, and then don't come up with any kind of proper recompense for an artist. It's, it's outrageous behavior. And I do feel that, you know, you, my exhibition and my, well, not so much the exhibition, but the um, residency was a box ticking exercise that was mm -hmm. required by yeah. the institution. Um, and I think the, um, the exhibition was just, I just feel utterly used and abused. Right, and there's also, w we see here how, um, you know, how that, this system excludes, the, if you had been relying on that money, if you were on, yeah, really, yeah, you couldn't have, if, you know, there are people who are, and artists who are in situations where they cannot wait another week uh, to receive the money, so, costs nothing to the institution, but this kind of, of whole bureaucracy and the inertia of the bureaucracy, that excludes people who need the money. So that means that who is left in those circles, people who are already privileged, people who have the means, um, who don't depend on that money or who can have enough money um, saved to, to wait. Um, so this is how you end up with a 
whether certain classism, elitism, even by accident, even if that's not intentional, but the system works in such a way that if you are marginalized in certain ways, then you do not have access or you cannot survive in those circles. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think, you know, for me, um, my earnings were so poor that year, um, they were bolstered by the fact that my father had died and, and I'd had some inheritance and that was supported by that, but that had an impact on other things as well. You know, and I think these people who have salaries and are completely protected by a system, they have no duty of care yes. to we, the people who come in and do the things that actually are important. We, we are the people who, um, I think people forget that, you know, without, without the artists making the work, there wouldn't be galleries or museums. There would be nothing and you would not have a job. Mm -hmm. You know, we are the people who are making the stuff and there should be some reasonable approach to how this... So this is why I really want to, to say, you know, and, and I will be writing a formal complaint. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a very difficult emotional time after this, but I will be writing a formal letter of complaint to the Arts Council and recommending that certain safeguards are put in place for artists because right now, you know, the institutions are doing these things and... It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that we're the ones who've done the work and we're the ones who are suffering the financial pain because they can just go, oh, we, we've done this. Aren't we wonderful? They're not. And this, you mentioned something that I can also, get, that I have experienced is the fact that we're, yeah, we're dealing with people who are on a salary. So the time, you know, even the, the entire time where there's the preparation, the um, prior conversations, all of that, they are being paid to have those conversations, whereas you not guaranteed to have any any outcome to this. And I've been in situations where, you know, I gave my time for meetings, I gave my ideas, suggestions, how the event could work or how the workshop, because I deliver workshops. Um, so that's that's already work. That's work for me that they benefit from because they hear my ideas, my suggestions. And yeah, there's been quite a few times when that resulted in, um, well, thank you very much, but we've decided to take it in-house um, or to go with someone else, or we've had a change of priorities. We no longer have the time or the budget. So that person's work and life moves on because they getting paid no matter what. Whereas this is time that I've invested. This is knowledge. This is skills that I've already invested in this. And now there's no money coming out of it. I'm, yeah, there's no I, I would also caution artists about, you know, what I experienced was I would be called in for informal Zoom meetings. Yes. Yeah. And, and so lots of things are said. And, and sometimes, you know, when I think, I mean, I did challenge them, but mm -hmm. some absolutely outrageous stuff about, oh, you need to do this or you need, and I would say, but, you know, and, uh, you know, I hadn't recorded the meetings, obviously, because I hadn't set up the Zoom meetings. Um, and, and all of that just passed under the bridge, you know, the threats, oh, well, I wasn't in the job when, when you got your residency, so I could drop you at any moment. And so those things are not recorded. And, and so I would urge artists to ask to record all meetings, all meetings. Don't take any Zoom meetings that are not recorded. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's, a, good, that's a good advice. Um, I'm now I am represented by a manager and she helps me a lot with that and also sitting with me in meetings because, well, first, she deals with everything that happens before to make sure that I don't end up spending my time um, doing the work of someone who hasn't, who just doesn't know what they want from me, because that shouldn't be my time and my efforts to figure that out for them. But unfortunately, that happens very often. And um, so, yeah, the, to add to your advice, um, yeah, making sure that, and well, in my case, and I'm, I'm sure that's that's the case for you as well, and for many artists, I'm a very passionate person, mm -hmm. so I enjoy sharing my ideas and my thoughts, and if you get me started talking about something, 
I do it happily and you just press the button and off yeah. I go. But um, then if, if, if that it doesn't get in any way um, rewarded, um, compensated at least, then, then yeah, it ends up feeling very exploitative and we feel like we've been fooled. Um, and then very often people take advantage of this, whether they understand it, whether it's conscious or not. But what for them is, is a, a very pleasant conversation. For us, that's our work. That's our expertise that we've invested in this. And if it leads to nothing, um, that, that has consequences. For us. Yes, it does, and I think, um, and going back to other things, it's sort of in a, in a wider scheme of things, and that is, you know, I have great time for Arts Council England because I think um, not only have they supported many of the projects that I've organised, but in the past always very good with detailed feedback because sometimes your application you've missed out on certain things, and it's really really useful to have the detailed feedback. I'm very sad to say that the last application I did, um, which I did reapply for, and this and this wonderful exhibition is, you know, thanks to Arts Council England, but the um, the offer of detailed feedback had been withdrawn because they don't have the staff. And this is where I think, you know, the Arts Council does amazing work and um, and is very supportive of artists and very good to deal with. Um, and yet, you know, in a world where lots of money is being spent on, on other things, really the Arts Council needs more money. And, you know, I would advocate for Arts Council England to get a lot more money because they manage it incredibly well. Um, and they, they, you know, they're careful with their resources. They don't just give money for nothing. My God, the amount of work it takes to get any kind of grant at all. But, you know, I think that's that's good in a way because because you have to work for it and you have to think through what you're doing um but i do think i i think institutions are guilty of milking the arts council and and not delivering and and not treating artists properly right um i find it interesting that because the way you describe the process of applying um that sounds like uh, well, a lot of work, a lot of admin work that is completely unrelated to your creations, to your you making your art. So that takes you away from that. So I understand that you are you you want to defend the arts council, and that may not be their fault specifically. But in a context where, in order for you to deal with the institution, you have to do the paperwork. You have to do something that is not your job. Um, that in itself is already, because that may not be accessible to all of the artists. Um, I know that I'm someone who really struggles with, with forms, with paperwork, and I very often say I, I'm just a guy who makes video on the internet or who does trainings. Everything else is not my job. So if you want something from me, you should do not burden me with those things that are completely unrelated to the work that I do, to, to, to what I can do. So that's also something with the institution. It's, it's very, very often it's, it's, um, it's put the, bur the burden of communication and filling the forms, etc. cetera. And th that's an entire language, knowing how to navigate those spaces, the grants, the applications. That burden shouldn't be on the individual when you have an entire institution who is paying people to sit on, in, on their laptop all day, and that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. That's also what I do most of the day, that's my work. Um, but those people are paid for that. Um, so it, yeah, it should be, the institution well, should make more effort. To be fair, Arts that. Council England does offer a lot of support for, for people who are applying, but who are maybe dyslexic or blind or all kinds of things. And they do offer support like that. So I. I, I can't I can't bring myself to be too critical of Arts Council England. I think they, they the process is difficult because it is a competitive process and there's only a limited pot and they've got to give things to they've got to give support to people who are going to kind of deliver the most. Um, but you know, I take your point completely because <laughs> because I spend a lot of my life writing um, and I didn't set out to be a writer. 
um, I'm an artist, but you know, I, I do accept that and I don't mind it. I don't mind it when it's transparent and it has the feeling of fairness. What I don't like is where there is, I can see that it's rampantly unfair, that it doesn't, you know, that contracts are not provided on time, that um, there isn't the support, the support that was promised does not get delivered at all. Um, and yet you're there, you're hung out to dry because because that's your earnings for the year. And that's, and, and not only that, because you want to do it. As an artist, you want to do the best you can for an exhibition. You want to make the best artworks. You want to be able to make the experience as good as possible for every visitor. So, you know, you're, you're operating on that kind of schedule where you've got a whole lot of people that you're dealing with who are going like, how much time can I get away with? How I, you know, I don't need to spend time doing this, this and this. You know, can I spend five minutes doing that? And, and, and not think about it. I, things, simple things like I'd asked, I wanted to do some, given I was doing a residency, I asked for specific information about, because I, I thought of a residency with an institution as being collaborative. <laughs> I got it wrong. Um, there was no interest in collaboration at all. I'd asked for specific kinds of information that I could have fed into my visual artworks and I was told, oh, well, I don't know how, I don't know where to get that. I might know somebody. And then months later, oh, oh no, I, no. So there was no conduit for, so there was no access to archives. There was no access to, you know, contacts that would have been inter interesting that you could have followed up and, and done, done work that made the, it really specific. And so the work that I did in Liverpool, I did all myself. I just went in there and, did the research and spoke to people, and I had absolutely no institutional support for that. Right. Well, I have a question for you in a second, but first I would like to ask you if you would like to participate in this conversation. Um, you don't have to, but no? Okay, cool. Well, if you want to say anything, you're welcome to join. Okay. And, and thank you. This is Sana Nasari from Exiled Writers, Inc. So welcome. And after yes, the event yeah. last night that we had here, it's great that you've come back. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, yes, I wanted to ask, so you've gone through those situations and you said that you've learned your lesson. Um, and, and maybe before we, we talk about um, what you suggest to do differently or what you do differently now, I, I would like to ask you about the people who could help in those situations? Have you identified either, yes, who, who can the artist turn to if they find themselves in such uh, a situation with, uh, with institutions? Well, to be honest, I have no clue. Yeah. I actually have no clue. I don't understand the hierarchy mm. that I would have to go through to make a complaint. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of these uh, institutions are sort of organisms that are self-protective. And so, you know, things don't get passed on. Everybody keeps quiet about stuff. What I've noticed is, um, you know, and it's a bit like the, the HS2 debacle, <laughs> is that when people behave really inefficiently and badly, they get promoted up. Oh. And, and so I don't know, as an artist, how I would deal with that. Mm. All I know is that I'm going to be so careful about any collaboration with an institution in the future because as far as I'm concerned, you know, the collaboration that I went through last year cost me money because I could have sold more work. Uh, you know, you can't sell the work that's on exhibition. Mm. Uh, and it, it cost me money and, uh, and, and grief and stress. Um, and the idea of being threatened with legal action for any kind of criticism, I, I just wonder, you know, what kind of tendencies do these organizations have? I mean, what kind of conscience do they have? Obviously none. Mm -hmm. And do you think that, because we're talking about the relationship between the artist and the institution, but the artist is not by themselves here. There's also the public. And have you thought, and again, that might be, you might not have an answer to this, but have you thought of ways that the artist could um, bring the public into that that um, relationship and 
Yes, well, interestingly, there were quite a number of members of the public who came around to guided tours of my exhibition mm -hmm. at the end. And when I said to them, they said, oh, so your work is going into the collection here. And I said, well, no, it's not. And they actually wrote feedback saying oh. this artist's work should be in the collection. Mm -hmm. So so there was that. But it's not in enough numbers. And you can't, re you know, if somebody comes to an exhibition, you can't turn it into a sort of petitioning opportunity. Much as you would want to, you can't. Um, and I think, I, I think, you know, when numbers speak for themselves, when you've had, you know, really great numbers and great feedback in, I think um, that should be a pressure on purchasing committees. I think it's the problem is with the purchasing committees, actually, and who they are made up of. And I think universities and institutions should be looking at who is in our purchasing committee, um, because there certainly should be somebody from the Arts Council there. It's, you know, Arts Council is giving money to these people, mm -hmm. which is not being sort of filtered down properly. And so I would say the Arts Council should have a, a, a representative on every purchasing committee in every institution in this country. Right. And, and that should be obligatory. Mm -hmm. And if we think of the sort of leverage that the artists can hope to find against um, the institutions, um, there's the example that's the only one that I'm aware of, but maybe it happens more often than I'm aware of. Um, with the, the, the Barbican, there was um, Evolve Collective, which was an artist collective who were being exhibited at the Barbican. Um, but after a few weeks, they withdrew their collection. They cancelled because they they said that the conditions, they didn't feel respected by the institution, by the staff at the institution, at the Barbican, and therefore they removed their pieces and they canceled the, the collaboration. Um, is this something that you've heard of before? Is this something that you've considered doing? Well, to be honest, to be honest, it would be impossible financially to do that mm -hmm. because, you know, if you're a recipient of a grant, you have to fulfill the conditions of the grant. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, right, that's it. I'm not doing this five-month exhibition. I'm off. <laughs> you, you can't do that. You have to fulfill those conditions. What and, if you um, can establish, you can prove that you have not been respected on that and you know the institution didn't fulfill their part of well the problem is that you've got many elements of mm -hmm. the institution so it's not just you know it, it's not just one part of the institution you're dealing with so for me for example there was an institute that was um kind of so-called sponsoring me with with the exhibition there was the exhibition space itself um and then the purchasing committee they're three different entities and so if I were to withdraw the exhibition, A, I would find that professionally the most terrible thing to do. I mean, I, I have never cancelled an event in my life or missed a deadline. I, I, it would be just an anathema to me. But, um, but equally, um, you know, when I think of the wonderful staff at the museum and gallery who were just so invested and brilliant, I, I, would, I would not want to let them down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the public itself was brilliant and right. and so engaged, and and I would feel I I, I would struggle to do that. Um, but but yeah, I mean, financially, I would not have been able to do that. I barely got paid for what I did, and way late. If I had withdrawn my stuff, I wouldn't have got paid at all, and I would have you know everything would have I would have just been in debt not just earning the grand total of 9,000 odd a year, I would have been actually, you know, minus mm -hmm. money. And is there such a thing, or, or do you think there could be such a thing of an artist union, a body that would represent and defend the interests of the artists, especially dealing with institutions that are so much bigger than the individuals? Well, there is an artist union, okay. of, of which I'm a member. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. so um, the problem is we're we're incredibly not powerful, right. and and I think this is where the Arts Council could actually make a real difference, and come in and give us a bit of tooth, you know, um, to do things because right now I mean what are you going to do if you're an artist go on strike, who would notice, mm -hmm. you know it's not like the film industry you go like I'm on strike but people are still showing your work I mean you, you know you yeah. it, it it's impossible to do. 
Um, but that's where you could use the public to your advantage there. You could, but I think... The platforms that you have. I, I wish that... I don't have as many followers as you do, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so envious of your followers. But anyway, I, I can't imagine that I could summon up a, you know, a, a flash mob to, mm. to do something. And uh, no, I, it, it, it's, di it's difficult. It's difficult because as an artist, once your stuff is up there, well, it's up there. If you choose to take it down, then any financial support you've had to achieve that will be withdrawn. So yeah. that, that's the problem. I don't know, how, how did Evolve um, have funding for the Barbican? I don't, I, I don't know those details. So I, I, ima I imagine that, well, they must have taken a hit, but clearly they were able to do it. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure how, but I do know that they made a very public statement, and that was also yeah. the strength of of their action. Mm. Um, so you know they definitely involved the public in that and the community as well that yeah. they were trying to represent, because that was also an interesting example of an institution that claims or pretends to let in a community or voices that are marginalized. Mm. So the intention was probably there, but what are they doing after that, after letting them in to make sure that they feel comfortable, they mm. feel that they being accom accommodated for, that they receiving the help that they need, because if you are already part of a structurally excluded mm. identity, community, um, then navigating those spaces requires more help than someone who has the, the, the culture, the sure. habitus of evolving in those spaces. So are the institutions aware of it and what are they doing besides just booking artists that yeah. they think represent diversity? Yeah. There needs to be a much deeper change than just who you let in. It's also, exactly. are we creating the conditions so that they can stay in this space? As a matter of interest, what were the specific issues for Evolve at Barbican? What were the areas that affected um, them? Well, that would have been great if, if, if uh, we were a member of, of Evolve were here, but uh, so apologies if that reaches them. I'm gonna try my best to, um, to represent what they, they said, um, the little that I know about it, but there, there were complaints about the way that the staff were treating them as artists and also the people that it tried to bring in. So they felt, because this is a, a collective of black people, um, and they felt that there were some underlying um, racism or at least um, disdain that was um, displayed by the staff. Um, they were asked, uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, um, they were told that they couldn't stay much longer. Basically, they were not being treated like other artists would have been treated. That's uh, really they were shocking, almost actually. That's assumed really to shocking. be mem members of the public or treated like yeah. disruptive members of the public when that space yeah. should have been theirs anyway. So even if they did choose to stay a little bit longer because yeah i think there was an issue where they were asked to leave um at closing time or something like that when they knew for a fact that the same request had not been made to other artists um so there seemed to be so there was that and yeah i'm not sure if i remember but i, I do remember that which is different from your experience because you said that the staff there w had was yeah. wonderful but that was not their experience. And they felt that both the, the public was not treated with the respect that they deserved and themselves had not been treated by members of staff and by the, um, the institution in general. Uh, yeah. it's, that's really shocking to hear, actually. And, and I'm astonished that the Barbican didn't step in and just try and sort that out as quickly as possible. Well, unfortunately, the Barbican has a long history of, uh, of having issues with that. I found out um, when that story came out, I found out there that had been a book published in 2021, um, a collection of experiences of members of staff of color, but also artists who had yeah. worked with the Barbican and who were talking about the institutional racism uh, of the Barbican. So after that book was published, I, as far as I'm aware, there were some changes in in the 
directors and the people up there. Um, but, you know, how much of it is cosmetic? And yeah, it's great to change some people, but if the structure doesn't change, if the way that things operate don't change, then that's not enough, just changing who's at the head of it. So what do we do moving forward? What do we do to change structures? I mean, I think there's a certain amount of leverage with Arts Council England. I think obviously any funding body in the country should be demanding of any institution that's gaining funding to do basic things like ensure um, prompt payment of artists, to ensure that um, artists are not um, being asked to do things that they shouldn't be asked to do and that they're not being threatened. Um, what else? I mean, are, are, what are the things that if, so if we were serious about putting forward a manifesto for how artists should be treated by institutions, what are some of the key factors that you can identify? I would say that the institutions must have very clear and intentional policies acknowledging the systemic discrimination and inequality that already exists in society. And they have to be to make it very clear what they intend to do to um, to compensate for that, because it's not just about or trying to do our best to not discriminate. We know that society is unequal. So what are you doing as an institution to make sure that you go out of your way to bring in artists that would normally not have access to those circles? But again, not just about bringing them in but also making sure that you create an environment where they feel comfortable, safe, respected, represented. So it's not, again, just about changing who goes through the door, but also what's in the room and what environments they will find in the room. But that has to be explicit. That has to be publicly stated and disclosed in, you know, in mission statements. Um, and yeah, so just like combating racism, combating sexism, it's not just about good intentions. Mm -hmm. There have to be clear measures put in place to deconstruct the systems and structures that are already producing inequality. So yeah, actions and yeah. a plan made public. I agree, and, and it's that, uh, that issue of transparency, so that you know, if something is done, it's above board, and and you have some comeback, and there should be an ombudsman, actually, for ombudswoman, to um, to deal with these issues because um, because they will arise. And for sure, I mean, I understand that institutions can also have bad experiences with artists who don't fulfil their obligations. Um, but again, if there if there were a sort of ombudsperson on board to um, to deliver a verdict on that, that would be a protection for everybody. Um, but I, I do think, you know, funding bodies need to be much stricter on institutions because, you know, they're very strict on individuals. When you make a, an Arts Council application or an application to any, you have to fulfill all kinds of things and, you know, delivery of reports and, and, and financial details, all the rest of it. You have to be very, very... Um, prompt with that. So I don't understand why that would not apply to an institution and they just get away with it. Yes, because here you're touching upon the inequality of consequences um, because, yeah, the, the consequences are not the same for the institution and for the individual artist by themselves. Um, so the reward, the lack of reward is already something, but the, yeah, the, the punishment sometimes or even the yeah, consequences are not experienced in the same way and cannot be weathered in the same way. Um, so that's definitely something that has to be acknowledged. Now, is it from the institution's role? I don't know, but that's something that definitely needs to be, to be talked about. And also I would say for the institution to establish clear goals, and also, so for instance, um, it could be very easy for an institution to say, well, we do not, uh, we do not exhibit artists of certain minorities simply because we know that our public will not be interested in that. 
And I would say that this is not enough to just to hide behind that. That's bizarre. Yeah. I, well, I don't know if that's the case, but I know that very often for for you know institutions, if the goal is to you know regardless of what the measure of success is, but there needs to be they need to take into consideration that success might imply the um, confirmation of already existing inequalities. So there will be certain types of artists that will draw more attention, that will make an exhibition more successful. So the the institution shouldn't just consider that and think, okay, who are the artists that will guarantee success, but also if we accept and acknowledge that society in itself is biased, is racist, classist, misogynist, sexist, what are you doing to expose your public to things that may challenge their yeah. taste or their affinities, their, their, their preferences? Because in those preferences, there's already the expression of injustice and inequality. So it could be also the goal and the the duty of the institution to challenge that by exposing their public to things that they know might not initially resonate with them. Exactly, and it's also a sort of, that means that institutions have the potential to be a counterbalance to the very commercialized art world as well. And, and so where you are presenting art that isn't about people having to buy stuff, they can go in and have an experience of art that is truly democratic and it, the, the art, it, you know, it's theirs and, and they can go in and own that. Um, and I think uh, you've, you've missed out on ageism there. So as an older Irish That's woman, true, yes. uh, there's that too. I have my own yeah, blank like, spots. Uh, yeah, you know, know, we all terrible, do. Terrible. But yeah, so it's, I, I have a, a friend who's called it misogynageism. Uh, misogyn which, where you just put all those isms in one thing and hey that's me and that's crap but i do think the i i think you're absolutely right about the sort of challenging and this is where public institutions are so important to challenge the kind of narrow ghettoized view of what art can be and just because people go in and say oh i don't know what that's about and then they go and go like oh that's really interesting i like it um because they haven't had the chance to taste it before and that's what you want to do you want to give people that opportunity and also that is not about the commercial sector it's not about giving artists who are already immensely successful commercially um, an automatic space for in the public domain because they've got a space already let's give these spaces to those people who don't have you know, those spaces, like Evolve or like me, or whatever. But, you know, spread spread the love. Um, and I think, I, think, I think it's very important that funding bodies have a proper policy about this and that they are very demanding of those institutions that get grants. Right. Um, well, I, I would have a question and then maybe that would give me ideas for what I could suggest. But do you, are, you, are you aware of what is considered success or what would the, the funding bodies, for instance, look at in order to decide whether to fund an artist or fund an exhibition? What would be the general, most, yeah, most classic points that people would look at? Okay, well, I think that there are artists who are immensely rich and successful and, and museums will buy their exhibitions in because people pay money to go and see them. Right. So, you know, if you're Anselm Kiefer, you don't have to worry too much. You're fine. You're doing good. And I love Anselm Kiefer's work. I mean, it, this is not a criticism of, of artists who are successful. But I think there should be, um, in terms of um, monies from the public coffers, there should not be money going to um, commercial um, exhibitions where the, there probably isn't already actually mm -hmm. where you have to pay to get in that you should okay. never get yes. funding for mm -hmm. an exhibition like that because you know the collections 
uh, the the owners of the collections or the custodians of the collections will be charging money to people like the Royal Academy or Tate or whatever, and they buy them in, but they've got memberships and they've got pay. So that's fine. I think the um, the monies should be given to people who are um, who are good, whose work is good and uh, perceived to be good and perceived to have real public interest and um, and and you know uh, uh, and be valuable so, to society. The and the problem money, with the public yeah. interest, though, is that it That's true has too. to be the artist must have had already been the public must have already been exposed to that artist in order but for no, it to be interest. But no, mm. no, because that's the responsibility of the institution. Okay. Because yeah. this is where, you know, you come in. I went up as an unknown artist to Liverpool um, to the Victoria Gallery and Museum and people loved the work and came in. And the giving the space to me allowed the public to come in and increased by 28% the footfall. So um, how did you know about that? How did you find out? I asked. Okay. I asked for visitor numbers, and I was mm. very, very keen that that should be, and 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 also, you know, I wanted to know who the visitors were. Um, there was a questionnaire which was not particularly well designed, which meant that most of the people who filled in the questionnaire were English speakers, and they tended right. to be older white people. Mm -hmm. Whereas I was there on the ground watching the visitors come in, with the clicker and all the rest of it. And they were actually at least 50% of the students at the university, right. most of which, or most of whom, were not English born and mm -hmm. would have been, you, uh, English would have been their second language and they would not have felt able necessarily or willing to fill in the questionnaires. So, measurement of audience numbers, I think, is massively interesting. And we've been doing that in, this ga in the gallery okay. to find out about these things because. These are important things to know because if you have an exhibition where only a certain demographic is going, mm -hmm. you've got a problem. Right. You've yes. got a problem. Yeah. So my ambition as an artist is to have a demographic that's everyone, everyone, all ages, all backgrounds, all abilities. It's there's something for everybody. And um, and so far, we're you know, we haven't got <laughs> huge numbers here. It's not like Tate, but it does indicate that we are getting a very right. mixed demographic, mm -hmm. which is great. That is great. And so that's something that you've always been doing. Yes. Um, okay, so, and I suppose you would recommend that to all artists. Completely. Um, Completely, your work is for everyone. Mm -hmm. Your work is for everyone. Make make your work something where everybody comes in and, and feels some level of engagement and welcome. And, that might not always be possible. I understand that as an artist, you might want to make very contentious statements. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a different kind of thing as well. And there's room for that too. Um, but I think, so in the context of this exhibition, which is a group exhibition, the work is very varied and very diverse. And so there's something for everybody. And I think right. there's a lot to be said for that. You know, from a from a... From the perspective of somebody who goes to exhibitions, I often prefer to go to exhibitions with a number of artists rather than a solo show mm -hmm. because I find the diversity very interesting and that right. conversation between people making different artworks in different ways and maybe addressing the same themes but in radically different ways from different perspectives, I find that very interesting and engaging. Right, and that's... That's, that has to be the product of, of partnership between the artist and the, the place, the gallery, the institution, in order to make, because that's, that, that's a responsibility that, is, that lands on both, both bodies um, to um, ensure that there's a diversity of people coming in. You as an artist, who you art attracts, but it's also who the space attracts, and that's not necessarily something that you have full control over. Mm -hmm. um, the name of the, the gallery or the, the venue that you exhibit in, that's going to have a huge impact on your exposure. So that can only be the result of a successful partnership. And so, yeah. That's right. And so, so if, if we're bringing this discussion to a close, mm -hmm. and have, has anybody got a question? If you've got a question, now is the time. Now? 
So, so going forward, let's let's do a point by point thing. <laughs> what are what are the things that institutions need to do? What do artists need to do? Manifesto. We need a manifesto. So yes. Um, well, so a, a stronger body that represents the rights and the interests of the artists facing facing the institutions because there's an imbalance there. So you said that there's already a, a union, but clearly that is not enough. Um, and I would say that there needs to be from the institution a willingness to be transparent and for instance to be in, in your situation where you went through um, the payment that you'd received, not only should that, that have been agreed upon but prior to your exhibition, but also itemized um, very specifically because you gave examples of things that you had to do prior to the exhibition that was unpaid labor. So this should have been already decided, mentioned, you know, that should have been a line in your... In, yeah, in well, your to be fair, I didn't realize I would have be having to do everything <laughs> mm. until I'd actually got into it. And, um, and I, I realized very early on that there was a lack of competence and so in terms of getting a catalogue designed, getting all of these things done, that came down to me. So the administration of the, of the whole project came down to me. And also there was a mistake made with the budget because they were a bit clueless in terms of putting in a budget. So the budget that I designed for them was just under £30,000, which covered everything. And they they got awarded £23,000 because they forgot to put in contributions in kind and stuff. So like a level of incompetence you cannot imagine. So we were already operating below par. So, and also refusing to share the final um, um, application that went in with me, even though I had put most of it together. So I was not able to look at the, the budget mistakes that were made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so more really transparency basic things. from the institution. Really basic things. Yes. Um, so, but I would say for artists, contracts, contracts, and don't do anything until the money is yeah. paid. Don't mm -hmm. don't actually do anything until the money is paid. I've learned my lesson the hard way. Right. And so for the institution, I would say also try to diversify who gets through the door in terms of artists who you who you book but also pay much attention to what they will find once they're in um, make sure that they are they find an environment that is um, supportive um, accepting of them and uh, making room for their identities their communities as well um, and yes, also not necessarily considering the artist as just one individual, but very often they can be a spokesperson for an entire community, an entire experience. Um, so taking that into consideration and making sure that people of the same identity, of the same community would feel comfortable in that space. So that's a much harder work than just going through a list of black artists and deciding to, to book them, um, even though that has to be done as well, but um, artists of minorities, so that includes women as well, of course. Um, so yeah, in that diversifying, that, that would be my point. Exactly, and, and if somebody has a five month exhibition that goes well, you need to add their work to your collection. And, and there should be a caveat on all Arts Council grants that if an institution applies and is successful for an exhibition of that length, it should be incumbent upon them to purchase an artwork for their collections. Yes, and you mentioned something very important, success. What counts as success? Defi defining what would make the exhibition successful, what is the threshold? Uh, that's something that, um, that should be discussed with the artist yes. beforehand um, so that then there's no hesitation or no way out oh yeah sorry we we're expecting no the 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 notion of success has to be established mutually established so it shouldn't come from just the artist or just yeah. from the institution but that's something that you should agree upon beforehand and and once you've assessed whether you reached the goals and whether that was successful then yes they should be also that should be set in stone in writing 
should the exhibition be successful, this is what the artist should expect. Um, and then the artist can go knowing full well what's going to happen. They can still choose, do I want to go forward with it mm. or not? But yeah, so. Yeah. And a big thing, don't threaten legal action when an artist criticizes you because you don't have a leg to stand on and we've got friends who are lawyers. So on that <laughs> note, thank you yes. so much well, for this you. evening and, well, um, and hope you found this interesting. I'm going to turn off the live stream now. <laughs>